see the chat here and I have the slides here. So I will be reading the chat along the way. Um, hello everyone, my name is Amr Tabit and we'll talk about how to combat ransomware through threat hunting. I had a lot of ideas of what I should present because I didn't know if the audience mostly are people who are working in companies or people who want to build their career in cybersecurity. I will try to help both and uh, let me know in the chat what's your goal out of this presentation if you can write in the chat and I will be reading it through the whole uh, training and through the whole session and we'll see how we can make it suitable for everyone. So uh, the main goal of this presentation when I created it is to understand EBT attacks and target ransomware attacks, understand how real attacks look like. We have a lot of people who are learning cybersecurity. They don't really see a real attack. They don't know how it exactly looks like. And does it look like the different CTFs they join or different hack me machines or how really the attacker gets into the world most secure networks, how they be able, how they able to get inside this network, how they are able to take control over a company like Sony or uh, or Rockstar when we heard about their attack or any of other big companies. And um, uh, if you are working in a company uh, or you are planning to work in a company, we will be covering what are the most common weaknesses, what are the weaknesses that your company might be facing that led to. Um, Lead that you are uh, you are targeted by these attacks, and these attacks are really successful. This uh, ransomware attacks, or you are vulnerable to the next ransomware attacks. And lastly, how you can strengthen your own security using continuous threat hunting method that we'll talk about in the third part of the string uh, in this uh, session. So this session is divided into three parts. We're going to cover the attack, the weaknesses, and then how to uh, how to combat these weaknesses and how to have multi-layer of security using continuous threat hunting. So uh, I think the introduction did, so that's enough. Um, why ransomware attacks? The anatomy, the, stra the strategies to detect and uh, protect against these ransomware attacks. What are the prerequisites, the prerequisites of an effective threat hunting and how we can do it step by step and real examples at the end. So it's a, it's a bit hands-on or not really hands-on, but we have a bit of practical side at the end of it. And if you stay until the end of this session or you are listening to the recording a bit after, I have a gift for you. If you stay until the end of this session, I'm going to uh, share with you a cheat sheet we have built inside Maltrack. And this cheat sheet will help you to hunt for behavioral attacks and uh, um, and suspicious network activities or host activities inside your machine. It's built for Elasticsearch and Sysmon, but you can use it to hunt for uh, threats uh, using any different EDR like Carbon Black or something else. Also using any different SAM like Curadar or uh, or, uh, or Splunk or, or whatever the, or Sentinel, whatever the SAM you're using. So it's gonna be a kind of a step by, step-by-step -step guide to how you can hunt for threats. I'm going to give you that for free at the end of the session if you stay until the end. And let's go into the main So why we're talking about ransomware attacks? Let's face it, ransomware attacks and targeted attacks are really successful these days. There's 79% of organizations are facing ransomware attacks. 62% of them are, face, are facing ransomware attacks at least once a month. So it's really, really uh, the most predominant threats right now in the cybersecurity world. 43% of these uh, cybersecurity attacks are targeted towards small, medium businesses. So ransomware attacks don't go uh, all the time after the big companies. They go after the small businesses, the small, medium businesses. So even if you have a small, medium business, you might be vulnerable to, or you might be targeted by ransomware attacks. Um, it takes, Average on, on average, 197 days, almost 200 days, to just identify there is a breach. So the attack, the attacker can be there in the in the company network for 200 years or almost 200 years until you detect and eradicate this attack. That's a very long time. Ransomware attacks don't take that long to actually have the the full impact and encrypt everything and ask you for ransom. So there is a lot of attacks that succeeds to. Um, to get into, to take control over the organization, to encrypt everything and delete all the backups, just because you are late in detecting these attacks. Uh, and just until September to 2023, there was over 3,500 ransomware attacks. So by the end of it, I don't know what is the number, but it's more than 3,500, that's for sure. Um, again, 
ransomware attacks are financially devastating for any company. So if you know how to protect against it, you are the most needed in the market in that uh, in that regard. And if you are working in a company, defending against ransomware attacks is the most uh, important. This is the most the, the biggest risk you might face. Uh, MGM faces one hundred million dollars losses. Indigo lost at fifty million dollars because of a, a, a cybersecurity attack. Healthcare provider lost. 106.8 million following a ransomware attack. Some companies, small medium businesses, they might they might bankrupt completely and fail completely because of ransomware attack. Um, so how these attacks look like? How do you go step by step? So there are so many ways for attackers to get into a company. We see that the most known technique that attackers uh, used to get into any company and they start their attack, their initial access, where they get into the first machine inside the organization. It's not really what you see mostly in nutrition testing courses, where you are like targeting servers and finding a vulnerable uh, public facing service to attack. It's mostly uh, targeting the weakest element in the organization, which is the human. It's mostly targeting an endpoint or a workstation, a machine for one of the employees like HR or an employee in the payroll or in sales or any of these people. So it starts with a phishing. That's one very common uh, technique, spear phishing attack to get one of the employees. Um, password guessing, like uh, password spray attacks, for example. Um, valid credentials which is stealing different credentials from other services for this employee and use that because they uh, use that on his login to uh, his or um, you know in, into his machine and they know that people use the same password everywhere so they might steal a password for something else like facebook or something like that and they're able to use it uh, on his company account um exploiting a vulnerability using um and malicious documents with macros and some also some attackers might use something like um, uh, internet exposed services or something like that so this is the initial access phase the mostly phishing we see that's the most of the attacks some use you know uh, password spraying or other techniques or exploit like the vbn or the firewall or something after that they start their privilege escalation so they escalate privilege they uh, communicate with the attacker probably through HTTP or HTTPS to a website that the attacker controls, and they start moving inside the organization. They scan the network for uh, for who is the domain admins, who are the employees inside the organizations, uh, inside the organization, what are their groups, what are the organizational units like HR, payroll, all of that, what are the different branches of this organization, maybe there's France, US, all of this, and they start to find their way to move from one machine to another, to a third, to a fourth, to a server, to a bigger server, to the domain controller. So this is basically the plan. All of these steps, they are disguised as one of the employees moving from one machine to another, and lastly, once they take over the organization, they either exfiltrate data, steal blueprints, stuff like that, and deploy and destroy all the backups and then encrypt the data and uh, run around somewhere. Sometimes run somewhere is not the main target of the attack. It's just one of the ways for them to capitalize on their gains, but maybe stealing the data or harm the company reputation is their main target. And they say, well, I can put a ransomware and get extra, uh, you know, extra hundreds of thousands of dollars or maybe a few million dollars. Why not I go with that? So that's mostly what we see up here. Um, how the attack looks like it might be a scary picture. Might some of you, some of you know it already? Uh, might be not. But this is basically this is all the attack phases the attacker go through from. First, recousinance, and a lot of people think recousinance is like, you know, using NMAP, getting all the open ports, get all the different servers, get all the different uh, uh, subdomains and all of that, and OS fingerprinting, all of that is useful, but mostly we see in recousinance is that the attackers go after who are the employees in the organization, who reports to whom, what uh, what uh, SaaS products or what applications do you do use. Maybe they use uh, HubSpot, maybe they are using Confluence, maybe, maybe they are using OneDrive, maybe they are using, uh, you know, a Gmail or Google Workspace, maybe they are using Office 365 and so on. So this is the first part. Then the second part, they build the resources, they sometimes develop their own malware just for this attack. If it's against a big company, so they don't get detected, they do uh, create the servers, everything. And then they go through the initial access, which they go from 
uh, which we have covered, the phishing and all of that, uh, execute their malware, maintain resistance every time when the system restarts, scalate privileges to become the admin or the root so they are able to steal the passwords from the memory, bypass defenses, stealing credentials as we said, and then discover the other machines around. Maybe they are using IP scanner to find all the, around, the machines around them and discover the network structure, but also they might all, uh, discover the active directory who are who are the employees inside the company who have what privileges and what, what permissions to do what and which user they should target next. And then moving laterally from one machine to another, collect information, steal this information and send it to the attacker, the exfiltration, common control, and lastly run the ransomware. So this is the phases the attacker go through and middle attack gives you a list, of, a list of so many techniques that might be used in the attacks nowadays. And this list is getting increased um, every year or every few months. You can see more techniques have been introduced and more um, more attack vectors. It's really it's really well worth to study these attacks. Just go into the Wikipedia. A meta um, meta attack has uh, or you know this thing they have a Wikipedia of all these techniques and different examples, different attackers who did use these techniques. It's really worth to just you know go through all of them and look into each one of them, understand what they are, look at the different resources and so on. Um, so moving on. An example of that is uh, is dark side um, ransomware. So dark side ransomware is a is an uh, is basically um, a ransomware as a self. So that means there is a gang or there is a uh, a group of, uh, of criminals or actor we call it uh, that actually develop the ransomware and they sell it to other actors or other groups. And these groups, each one buy the ransomware and they use the attack by themselves, use their own techniques and then uh, land the ransomware at the end. So this is some of the techniques they have used. One, for example, used, um, uh, you know, a uh, password spray. He suspected some passwords and started, you know, trying them with all the employees. This is one of them. Other used malicious uh, email with a link to a zip file or to a Dropbox link to a zip file with a um, uh, with like a shortcut that downloads a malware and went through there. One used a vulnerability in the in the VPN and is able to get inside the network and so on. So this is different ways to use the initial compromise. Phishing was one big part. The password spray and the vulnerability. Um, um, and then they maintained their foothold, they maintained the uh, resistance inside the organization using uh, their own malware. Uh, that's one uh, group. Others used uh, Cobalt Strike, which is a very known reteaming tool, very known framework for uh, different attacks. Uh, with with um, uh, with Cobalt Strike or their backdoor, is called Beacon. Uh, basically, you can change how the malware connects to the. Uh, to the attacker, you can change the way the network communicates, also can encrypt the file. So you can have a lot of changes in that beacon file. So it feels like a new malware, despite it's not. So that's what they went for, some of them, and also for another known framework, uh, red teaming framework, or you know, an attack framework called F-Secure C3. So that is how they maintain resistance. Then these created privilege, they become the admin in the machine and they started running uh, many cats or stealing uh, to steal different credentials in the memory. And then they started to look around inside the network. You see that they used IP scanner, but not only IP scanner, they used also different Windows legitimate tools and other tools to understand who are the employees inside the organization, who are the different accounts inside the organization, and they use the whole, uh, what's called discover the Active Directory. Active Directory is like the whole directory of all the employees and their groups and their permissions and everything about the resources inside the organization. Regardless of that, resources are people, groups, servers, machines, um, you know, any type of resources are stored in something called Active Directory, if you don't know about it. And discovering that anybody has read access to this Active Directory, or most of people who have, maybe almost all of the people have an, uh, a read-only Active Directory access when they are part of the, the company. So stealing one employee uh, Password can get you to understand the whole Active Directory world and who reports to whom and so on. So that is the recognizance. Then they started moving inside the company. They might they used some legitimate tools like a uh, team viewer, like um, 
uh, like RDB, like remote desktop, uh, and other tools that already known beside the their malware as well, or Cobalt Strike and so on. After that, they used uh, legitimate tools like R-Clone or WinSCP. They stole, um, they started stealing different data. R-Clone is a legitimate tool that upload files to Dropbox and OneDrive and so on. So they used legitimate uh, products to steal uh, information. And as well, they, after that, they run dark side, encrypted everything, and they went. So this is just an example of so many different attackers in that process. Um, something similar like Qbot, malicious email, uh, they, they infected one employee inside the organization, and then from there, they started the resonance, similar tools, uh, understand to uh, start targeting the domain admins, the uh, are going after active directory they used qbot which is their own malware their own ransomware they used cobalt strike as well the beacon to maintain uh resistance and they started stealing passwords from the from the web browser from different caches from different websites the user log into and then from there they started going from one machine to another until they had control over the organization and then they run their own ransom and you can see that over and over Again, they all target endpoints first, and then they move laterally inside the organization. They move from one employee to another. They are disguised always inside the organization as one of the employees. So you can see an employee that you know of doing some suspicious activities or logging from different countries, like, I don't know, for US, maybe Russia or, some, or China or something like that, uh, targeting the weakest element in the organization, which is the human. Their vulnerability stays forever. There's no patch for uh, human vulnerabilities, unfortunately. And the use of legitimate applications as well, using known application like TeamViewer, like R-Clone, which is a actual legitimate tool. Uh, NGROC, it's also a very known tool uh, uh, you can you know, you know, you can get to know it later, but it's a very known tool as well. And they use legitimate tools and Windows built-in tools to perform their attack. They don't need a remote desktop, for example, or something like that. They don't really rely so heavily on malware only. They might also rely on legitimate tools. Um, they leverage the um, the weaknesses inside inside the, uh, the Active Directory and. As we said, they, move, they use legitimate tools to move laterally inside the organization. Um, guys, any questions so far? You can drop your questions in the chat. I'll be watching it, and I'll be answering it also uh, if it makes sense in the middle of the session. Also, I can see your, your comments, your chats, so please let me know if you are still listening here. Thumbs up if you do, or thumbs up in the chat. I want to know if you guys are listening and you are here with me, so yeah. Uh, you can write the questions in the in the chat. I'm looking at the chat. I will not be able to give hands to people, but at least I will be reading the chat. So that is the first part. This is how attacks look like. Then the question is, so why we are not able to protect against them? Why we are still failing to detect these attacks and protect against them? Well, there are six reasons I have put here in the slides that might be why your security is failing or what you can do to improve that. So the first one is purchasing more solutions. It's very, very common we see in different uh, CISOs or um, or managers or directors when they are in a company, they are thinking, okay, if I buy this new uh, network detection response or uh, endpoint detection response or IDS or IPS, this with the machine learning and AI and, you know, next gen and all of this XDR, all of these beautiful words, that this is going to be the way we're going to protect against these attacks. And this probably can be very, very costly different solutions. And I don't say these solutions are bad, but whatever the solution you're going to bring, you, need, you still need to fine-tune the solution to your own organization, to your, your own company. Uh, without a, a really a talented team to investigate alerts, to detect attacks, to, to respond to attacks, your tools are as effective as your team. If your team is not well-trained, uh, well 
then these solutions won't really help. They're still in the same level as your team. There's going to be a lot of alerts. Are your team able to look at these alerts, understand what they are, and actually do something about it? So that is the question that you need to have. Purchasing more solutions is not the solution. You still need to fine tune. You still need the team to be trained, not in just how to use the tool, but actually really trained on cybersecurity concepts, on incident response, on what to do and how to detect suspicious activities. So this is the first uh, the first pro problem that most people uh, have, is that they have a lot of great tools, but not really the team is not up to speed to be able to really investigate the attack. Second problem we see uh, is that um, they don't know their enemy. So intelligence is very important, and there's multiple levels of intelligence. So uh, you can't, you just can't defend against all types of attacks. You can invest into detecting phishing attacks. You can invest in the, into uh, having the next uh, level firewall or the WAF or this or that. You need to know, you need to understand your enemies and authorize what you need to invest in if you are in a company and uh, understand what the attackers actually do, what's their tactics, what their techniques, and um, uh, help training your team to defend against this, uh, tactics and techniques and help find new products to, to detect against these specific techniques. And I'm not talking about all types of ransomware attacks, but what might target your organization mainly and how you can protect against these ones. And, um, and it's not just the IOCs. IOCs is a great starting point, um, which is basically the indicators of compromise or like, let's say, the hashes of the different uh, malware that's being used. The... Um, uh, let's say the the websites the attacker used to you know uh, to get his malware to communicate to, or maybe the IPs of these uh, domains and so on, right? These are not really what's um, there's not everything about intelligence. You need to get to understand what are the IOCs. That's the first step. But the second step, understand the tactics and techniques the attacker have. Um, what exactly they are doing and how you how they are like what techniques they are using that doesn't change from one attack to another and how to defend against these attacks generally this type of attack so maybe they are using always malicious document or the macro maybe they are using always legitimate tools to maintain persistence like team viewer or something else maybe they are doing specific technique and you need to just detect against this technique in general and uh, the third is know yourself so i know that sounds cheesy but uh if you know the enemy and you know yourself you will not feel the result of 100 battles so um so you need to know the enemy who is targeting you how they are targeting you what's their techniques and tactics but also you need to have visibility over your network which means that you need to know what's happening on your endpoints what's happening on their machines what's happening in your network and all the different networks what's happening on the servers what's happening in the uh, in their identity side, who is logging to where, uh, when, how, and the applications in, let's say, your different services that are public facing, your website, what's happening on the website, who is logging to this website, who's trying to access what, and so on. So you need to have visibility over your network, your endpoint, your identity, your applications, and have at least the six months of logs for deeper investigation, it's at least, probably a year is even better, uh, and as well clear the noise inside your organization network. So if your your organization is like, there's people who are doing torrent and people logging to whatever websites and people downloading whatever the apps they have, and you have a lot of clutter out there, you will not be able to find the attack. You will not know if this process is an application the user has installed because he was trying a new tool out there, or it is the malware, right? Uh, you don't know what's this website. Is it a website the user is visiting or it is the, the malware and so on. So you need to clear that clutter to be able to see the attack and really make the attack stand out from the usual traffic, if that makes sense, right? So that is basically this part, the knowing yourself. So there are different levels of maturity for different companies. Some people, and I'm really having a problem looking and seeing this uh, small text, you can take a screenshot and zoom in, but the, uh, the lower maturity level is basically uh, just have um, 
mainly centers on like uh, antivirus detections, IDS, IPS, and some alerts. And this is the only way they are looking at attacks and they don't have a really consistent way of collecting data. This is the lowest maturity level to just have the tools, the antivirus probably, which doesn't give you much of logs. You have uh, here, let's say the uh, IDS on IPS or Snort or, what, or something, something similar, a firewall, and that's it. They don't, they just look at alerts that comes in and then they do something about it, but they don't really collect information. They're not, they don't have the ability to investigate. There's no visibility over the network, or even they don't know they're in it. The next step is people who, um, who investigate um, threat intels. They, they have some in information about their enemy, which they have some threat intelligence information, probably mostly IOCs, and they do collect they do collect some data, but not as much. They still collect some data. They're still consistently collecting logs, maybe for three months, something very little, but they do collect uh, logs. They don't really scan them. They look at the alerts, and as well, they virtualize the alerts using threat intelligence, which mostly free feeds online. The next level is using um, more correlated data, so not using just online, you know, hashes everywhere. They really have a good way of correlating information that's more related to them, and they understand more the attacker. Not really they go into the techniques and tactics the attackers use, but at least they have some really good third intelligence information that they can use probably with context, like this was this malware, that was the IP of the attacker, that was the IP of the server, so they know exactly what's going on, and they are maintaining the logs for six months or something like that a more a better level is people who are using their own data analysis they are diving into the data they are doing uh, some level of threat hunting they are also um, collecting the attackers tactics and techniques and as well they have a consistent uh, data collection they have more visibility and of course the leading ones who are uh, having more not just automated they have more of a, a threat hunting team they're investigating further they are collecting information maybe for one year or something they have visibility over the network, the network. they have visibility over their enemies and uh, and the attacks is happening there they can see the attacks they can see the new techniques the new attack vectors they create new detection rules they um, they, they fine tune their products and so on, which we're gonna cover how that should look like at the end of this session. Any question, guys? If you have any questions, just write in the chat. I don't know if you guys have access to the chat, actually. But if you have access to the chat, you can write in the chat. I do see it, so let me know. Um, fourth uh, problem is that a lot of companies, they have what's called an alerts fatigue. There's so many alerts. And uh, I have worked in companies, I have seen different companies where they say, oh, we only look at the top 50% of alerts. The other 50%, we just don't look at them at all. And that is, that is really dangerous because an attack can still be detected, but if it's detected with lower severity uh, type of alerts, like, oh, it's, a, it's not severe, it's maybe a low threat. A low threat alert, a low threat alert, he can stay hidden for forever just by giving low uh, low threat type of alerts because you just never look at them. And that's where, uh, where attackers can get through uh, most of the detections and stay inside an organization for so long. It's not the tools couldn't detect them, it's just it wasn't severe enough to block these attacks, and at the same time wasn't also severe enough for the SOC team to actually investigate. Uh, prioritizing alerts is really important. Uh, Fine-tune your detections to give less alerts and be able to really reach the optimum point to be able to detect attacks is also very important. And the third is automating uh, basic investigations to add some context to different attacks. So if you have a low threat alert, can you have an automation to investigate this info this um, this attack further, to collect some information, to analyze some information, to give you some context and give you uh, an additional score if there's something has been seen, if there's something um, a SOC analyst can look for uh, can look at it for two three minutes, look at the whole investigation report created by SOAR and actually respond to it, maybe the SOAR can able to investigate further, find something suspicious and automatically block the attack until or uh, or contain this machine isolated from the whole network until a SOC analyst look at it. So it can really, a deeper investigation, an automated deeper investigation can help a lot 
in, in this low threat type of alerts. A fifth thing is that once you have an attack happens, do you have a specific process to respond to this attack? Or you just, you know, all run around and don't know what to do. Oh, we are panicking, we are panicking, we are attacked. What are we going to do? You need to have a really good plan. And this plan is already developed, written. Um, know exactly, first is knowing the people. What, who are doing what? What's each person role? What are they going to do? When are they going to share this with the with the manager, with the director, with the CSO, with the shareholders? Who's going to do that? Who's going to take the lead? And more importantly, not just the team, the, the incident response team, but who can support the incident response team? So you have, let's say, if the attack uh, in, involves Oracle database, who is the IT admin? Who is his backup if he's away? And so on. So who are in control of different important resources inside the organization? And more importantly also, if the attack scale is really massive, who to bring into the, into the attack to help you with the response of this attack? So that is very, very important. And that could be separate companies who can join in to respond to this attack, or as well can be other people inside your organization that are not part of the, uh, of the incident response team that can that can participate, then you need to test these uh, plans and have uh, what's called drills to see if the team is able to take all of these roles and, uh, and arrange itself. And lastly, you need to have a clear uh, process of what you're going to do in every single step. You need to have the hardware in place. If you need hard desks, you need to have the hard disk cleaned, ready to be used. If you have, uh, if you need some software, then you need to have the licenses. Everything is ready. A lot of companies invest so much in the SEM and make sure that they have the licenses for all the different detection tools. But when it comes to investigation, incident response, they somehow either they don't have the tools or they don't have the licenses or they forgot completely about them. They just look at the front face. But the investigation tools is that we forgot about them. So you need to make sure that all the tool, all the software and hardware are available and ready to be used. Um, lastly is no trained staff or understaffing. Um, hope you guys all have a job after if you're not, and if you do, hopefully you can bring your teammates. But 62% of organizations feel they don't hire enough cybersecurity professionals. Um, and at the end of the day, whatever, how many AI you're gonna have, whatever is gonna happen, whatever the last, ChatGPT 6.5, I don't know what it's going to be next, but your security is good as your team, and I mean your human team, right? And without the right hands-on training, without the right uh, experience, they will be, your whole security is as, uh, as least effective as your team. So you need to make your team up to speed to be able to uh, to be able to detect and respond to attacks. And then you are working as a goalkeeper, which is like, if there's one ball that you couldn't stop, that means a goal, right? If one attack that slipped through the radar, that could be devastating. So it's different from being the attacker, being a striker. You can try to attack 100 companies, and one company can cover all the expenses of attacking all these companies. But you are the one who is the goalkeeper. You need to stop every single attack. So you need to make sure that your team is ready and is in that level. And I see a lot of companies that don't invest enough in the training or they don't invest in hiring the, uh, the employees that really are the ones who can protect against the attacks. They are way more important than the solutions. That's about all of the defense parts. I'm going to go into the last uh, section. Any question, guys? You can drop your questions in the chat uh, if you do have questions. If not, I'm going to go forward. So now we're going to talk about uh, continuous threat hunting. Uh, why continue? Why threat hunting first? And why do we need continuous threat hunting? And uh, how we can do it? So, what's threat hunting? Threat hunting, in a very academic way, as we are, you know, with academia. I'm not good with academia stuff. I'm mechanical engineer originally, so I'm completely far away. But anyway, threat hunting is a proactive validation of the network, of the network integrity in simple ways, is basically you're assuming you are already compromised, you assume even the technique and the tactic the attacker used to, to, uh, to get into your organization, and then you investigate that. So you assume, okay, I think that I am attacked with this, uh, with the malicious document with a macro, 
somebody send a malicious document, it include the macro, one of the employees has enabled the macro and the malware run. I assume that, right? Now, how I can validate that? That's the process of the threat hunting. So you always have this hypothesis at the beginning, and then this is human based, mostly comes from, we'll talk about how it comes from, but you come with a, an idea, a thought that you are being compromised and then you investigate that further. Why threat hunting is that it, be, it decreases the gap between failure and response, between that your detections and your team failed to detect an attack to the time when you discovered this attack and actually responded to this attack and you know eradicate the attack completely from the network. It helps de decrease the time of the breach inside the organization of course, from 100, from 200 days or 197 to hopefully five days, 10 days, which helps to decrease the the level of severity of that attack. If the if the ransomware never got to run the ransom or never got to delete the backups, well, you are uh, you are safe because it might encrypt some new files, but it wouldn't really be uh, much of devastating attack if you detected earlier. You might not be able to encrypt anything because you already detected the attack and eradicated the attack way before he starts running his ransomware. So, um, you know, the, the longer the attack stays in the network, the more devastating it can be. And if you detect it earlier, it can be not really a problem. Um, of course, to start to have uh, threat hunting, you need to have clear visibility over your network and also clear information or intelligence information about the attackers or your enemies. Um, so why th what is the difference between normal detections and threat hunting? It's a very common question. Traditional detections are mostly signature-based, there is a specific signature of a known malware, this QBot, this is Emotet, this is something we already know, and we're going to detect that. Or we have hashes, IPs, domains, so we're going to use them to detect different attacks, which we call the indicators of compromise. It's mostly reactive because the attack has already happened somewhere else. You just take the, the, the information and you scan your network with it. Uh, it's based on evidences, so it's very fact-based thingy it is very tool driven it can be fully automated you can basically just drop the hashes or have a you know um a known uh, feeds of threads uh, of threat intelligence that gives you all the hashes and ips and you have a tool that automatically scan everything and it can be sitting at home doing nothing and this tool can do everything for you that is the traditional detection which is great it's important to have but it's a little bit different than threat hunting Threat hunting is behavior based. So you assume a specific technique or tactic the attacker uses. The attacker can change his tools really, really fast, but he cannot really change his techniques so fast because he still needs to learn a new technique and test it and so on. So it's going to be way slower to change his techniques, but way faster in changing his tools. If he changed one byte in his malware, guess what? It has a completely different hash and all your hashes, IOCs doesn't work anymore. If he use AWS or Google Cloud or any cloud or Alibaba Express cloud, he can just, you know, rebuild his uh, his uh, project or rebuild his common control server and it has completely different IPs. He can buy a new domain, completely different domains and so on. So you can always change his IOCs or indicators of compromise, but he cannot really change his behavior as fast. So if you, threat hunting is based on the behavior, is dealing with tactics and his techniques, and is very proactive because this attack not, didn't happen in your organization yet, but you are basically proactively, uh, you know, investigating this attack. It's not like here, there's a signature has happened, you find the malware, then you investigate. The threat hunting you investigate first, and then you are basically responding to the attack uh, it's a human driven uh, you have to have a, a person who creates the new hypothesis and then he can use tools to assess in how he performs this attack and it can be partially automated you can take the new detections create an auto an automation or create a, a new uh, signature using the investigation idea you have created and use that to uh to, to be a new alert and that's basically the whole idea um there's multiple levels we said the iocs more updated IOCs following who are you targeting your organization. You can use anomaly detection, something that looks strange in your network. Of course, you need to remove the clutter and the noise from your network to understand what's really is anomaly. And then the, hy the hypothesis-based threat hunting, which we are talking about today. Um, that's okay. 
Why we are using threat hunting? Because APT attacks got smarter, they live off the land, so they, they bypass the antivirus, they easily blend in because they're using legitimate apps, they're using normal websites, and they can fight back as well. And we just need something that helps. Continuous threat hunting helps in detecting ransomware early, as we said, but that's not the only the only thing we need about continuous threat hunting. Helps you to fine tune your software solutions, uh, create new detections, which is very, very important. So it helps you to fine tune your, your already detections inside your solutions and also create new detections for you for new attacks. It helps you to evolve as the as the threat landscape evolves and your detections and everything evolves with it. Also, it trains your team by doing these threat hunting drills over and over and over, helps you to improve, get your team to be uh, to learn more how to investigate attacks, how to investigate different things, train them for ransom response. It helps also to detect any blind spots in your visibility. You don't know how, you don't have any detections or you don't have any visibility, no logs on this type of behavior or this type of, or these endpoints or these machines or even these servers, you don't have any type of logs that you ingest that you know about these attacks. Uh, it helps also detecting weak configurations, vulnerabilities, uh, or weaknesses penetration testing didn't find. At the end of the day, penetration testing is black box, threat hunting is more like white box, so it's more able to detect stuff probably penetration testing didn't detect. And again, it improves your IR plan. So I know we have around 10 minutes. I was hoping to get a lot of questions, uh, but we're gonna cover very fast in this 10 minutes how attacks can uh, can look like, how threat, in, uh, how threat hunting attacks can look like, or how we do the investigation or the threat hunting from the beginning to the end. I am uh, losing my mind. Um, so we're gonna cover threat, in the, threat hunting from from A to Z, like the steps by step, and with some examples. Uh, why most of companies fail to implement threat hunting is because there's no real visibility over the networks. Visibility is a big issue for a lot of companies. There are too much noise in the, in the logs, too much clutter, too many alerts, too many everything that they cannot really in, investigate that and find something that is really real attack. The attacker can easily, you know, uh, being, um, you know, can easily hidden between all of this noise. Um, the thing that uh, the threat hunting is just an ad hoc of a tool. This new Carbon Black comes with threat hunting. This new SAM, new XDR comes with threat hunting feature that you pay extra, I don't know how much, and you can get it, which is not really a full threat hunting. It can help, it can assist, but it's not a threat hunting. You still need to do threat hunting. Um, the thing that threat hunting is searching for IOCs, that's threat intelligence, not threat hunting. It's still useful, of course, continue doing it, but don't call that threat hunting. You still need to move to the next level, which is the threat hunting. And of course, a lot of people, a lot of companies fail in implementing threat hunting because they don't have a guidance. They don't know where to go with that. They don't have the senior team to really move forward with that. There's four types of threat hunting. There's the network based, which is you know relying on detecting common control, uh, communication, exploitation, phishing, password spray attacks, and they mostly rely on firewall locks, DNS locks, Zeek locks, all of these types. Endpoint, which is the behavior of the host-based machines, which can help detecting malware, scripts, and much more. And you can use the endpoint detection response logs, sysmo logs, even log, even using some investigation, like more of a real digital forensic stuff, you guys, and memory forensics or disk forensics, or just collecting artifacts like Cable, or Kanza, or any of these tools. Infrastructure-based threat hunting, which is like penetration testing, so vulnerabilities, public facing services, web attacks, so on. And lastly is the identity based threat hunting, which is um, looking for Active Directory attacks or uh, cloud attacks, AWS identities or Azure identities or Azure cloud and so on. Um, so yeah, that is basically the, uh, and that's, of course, you can use the event logs, you can use different uh, tools like uh, identity tools and cloud logs and so on. Um, the third hunting process looks like this. You first create your hypothesis, how I'm, I got attacked, right? Uh, that could be through, uh, you know, looking at the meta attack framework, uh, you know, uh, you know, say, okay, this technique, I want to hunt for it. This technique and this specific tactic, this phishing, spear phishing with a, 
a link to OneDrive is what I'm going to detect against, right? So I'm going to use that as a source or threat intelligence, looking at how the attackers do their attack and learn from it and take one of the techniques that I see common in my, in who might target me, the attackers that might target my organization and use that as a hypothesis or just for your critical assets. I'm I'm, I don't want this server to be attacked ever. That includes my my critical uh, passwords and you know or my customer data. I need to make sure it's very protected. I will assume it's being compromised. Uh, second part is see if this hypothesis is testable. Do you have the logs? Do you have the information? What information you can use? If you don't, then you need to create the visibility part. You need to start you know finding a way to get the information you need. Uh, finding data sources, you need to investigate if the hypothesis is correct. If you have investigated and you find really there's a malware or there is an attacker there, then you start an incident response process. If you don't, or even if you have found an incident and uh, an attack, at the end of the step, at the end of the whole process, you create a new alert, you create a new detection rule for this hypothesis. And this is why you are fine tuning your products and improving your products over and over. So you are always creating, you are always evolving because you're continuously creating new detections inside your organization. You don't just rely on the company updating their tool, but you are also updating your own tools and creating new detections. Um, so for example, um, a hypothesis that an attacker have used many cuts or a similar tool to perform past the hash attack. Uh, I'm using one of the endpoints in our, my organization. Uh, the attacker uh, have used the current victim login credentials uh, or the hash of his credentials to log into another machine. So he used one employee uh, inform, uh, password or hash of his password to log into others. How are we gonna detect that? Well, uh, first the data sources we're gonna use is Windows security logs. Uh, that's basically if we have at least three to six months of these logs. And uh, optionally, we can have Microsoft Defender for Identity and it does have its own logs or similar products like that. Um, the investigation process is that I'm going to look for an event ID. So now I, I have the Windows event logs. I'm going to look for a specific event that represents a successful login. I don't need to remember the numbers. Um, there's two types of way to log into a machine. There's Kerberos and IntelM. IntelM is obsolete, but it's mostly it's mostly now representing past the hash or some obsolete products inside your network. It's not really how normally people log into their machines. So this is could be a way to detect suspicious activities. There's specific way to uh, to use if you are looking for NTLM, a specific login type equal nine, which represents mostly past the hash. That's of course just one example. It might have some noise or something like that. Um, I can search for just this stuff and write my search to Splunk, but you can do that in whatever the same you have. This is the event code. The login is successful. They used NTLM, uh, uh, NTLM authentication. And the login type was nine. I will not go so deep into how that works, but that's one way. And then, did I find any active attack? If I did find, I can start an incident response. If not, I can create a new alert. This is a Sigma rule, a simple Sigma rule. Sigma is a tool that creates uh, detection rules for so many different uh, SEM products. You just create one. It's a kind of a standard that can be easily converted into any uh, SEM you have. And basically, it looks like this. Well, the log source is Windows. Security, the detections is that if I find an event ID with this number, which is uh, login successful, the login type is 9, which is, represents a specific way of past the hash attack or similar things. Um, the login process name, something, authentication package is negotiate, which is NTLM. Then if this all of this sounds right, then, you know, give me an alert. Now I have created a new alert inside the organization. Of course, in your company it might look different, uh, might be something you know much more better than Sigma rules, but Sigma rules is the free one. And then I have a new detection and I can use that. I can do the same with something like a remote desktop tunneling with NGROC. I'm not gonna go into that, I'm gonna share um, I'm just going to keep it there. Uh, basically, remote desktop is a is a very known way to connect to a machine, and it's mostly private. Injurok is a tool that allows you to tunnel this network to you know to the to the public to the internet. It's a legitimate tool, Injurok. So you might be detected, not detected as an antivirus, but can be used 
to basically make the remote desktop more public. And it looks like a tool connects to remote desktop on the same machine, and then this tool connects to the internet. So this is how it looks like, how it tunnels that network. I can look at system, uh, system logs, maybe network logs, but mostly system logs. And in Sysmon, I can look for ng-log process running. It's a tool called ng -Log. I can look for any domain connections to uh, ngrog.io. I can look for remote desktop connections connecting directly to another process in the same machine. That doesn't make sense. Why you connect remotely to your machine from your machine, you're already logged in. So something looks like that, that's very suspicious. I can use that as a way to detect tunneling. Uh, I can look for different logs, looking for different domains like ngrog, uh, ngrog.io, all of that. And this is a way you can detect these attacks. And I can, you know, if I find an attack, investigate, if not, create a new detection rule. So here, for example, I'm looking for uh, in, in Sysmon logs or ADR or something, or Carbon Black, uh, if the, the process named ingerlog.exe, and he has, like, let's say, uh, some command line, like HTB something, TCP, this number, or any of that, to detect any remote desktop or if he's trying to connect remote desktop and basically I can detect suspicious activities. Maybe you can block Injuroc completely out of your organization or have something that detects just any Injuroc running inside the system. And there are so many different ways I can create my detections, improve my detections and respond to attack. So that is the end of our session. You uh, recap, we need to have a clear visibility over your network and endpoints you need to have visibility over your enemies, threat intelligence. Continuous threat hunting helps you to find gaps in your detections, fine tune your, your solutions, train your team by having these drills of incident uh, response and digital investigation, and evolve as the threat landscape evolves. As I promised, here's a way to, to download your cheat sheet. That's a good way to start in threat hunting. It is basically for elastic search and system, but you can use it for any EDR, any SAM, any different types of logs. It's mainly for behavioral based detections, but also some for the network. And it does have a system of how you can investigate further and detect an attack or hunt for a new attack. Also, you can check my website, maltrack.com. You can use you can use it with without a www if you wish. And also you can go to uh, you can email me at enterprise at maltrack.com or support at maltrack.com as well. If you have questions and you're seeing the replay. I'll be happy to receive your questions. Uh, but if you have questions now, any questions? Uh, thank you very much, Sean. Um, a very, very interesting and very uh, insightful presentation. Thank you.